Good morning again. It's nice to see you. It's nice to see you. It's nice, I'm going to say this, it's nice to have a cooler day. A little bit of rain is good. Hopefully it's fine for, fine as in not too wet and uncomfortable for those that are doing round the bays. Uh, I don't know how many people are doing round the bays now, but it used to be about 80,000 people or something. So, so hopefully that goes well for them. For those of you who weren't here last week and you haven't watched the sermon online, can I encourage you to do so? There he is. John I gave a great message on the passage where Jesus was having a meal with um, others at Simon the Pharisee's house. And a woman comes in and washes Jesus' feet with her tears, dries dries them with her hair, and pours perfume or ointment on them. Now, what I personally appreciated about the message was the reminder that Jesus does not see people the same way we do. That sadly, we can write people off, see them as unclean or even worse, yet Jesus doesn't. And once again, like the week before, we were reminded that Jesus comes for the sick, the needy, not just those who or think they have it all together, that they are righteous. Today, today, I will not be including an illustration (laughs) as, how shall I put it, disgustingly good as the one Jono gave. Today we're looking at a meal that Jesus had that I have actually shared on even in a year that I've been here, except we're looking at a different passage and we're looking at a different part of it. When I mention it, someone in my family said, haven't you already preached on that? Um, It is not because I think that you didn't listen, it is because it is part of our series. It's a meal Jesus had with over 5,000 people. And like every week in our Meals with Jesus series, there are questions for your small groups. You can get the questions and some information at the table out the back before you leave. You will see when you get the questions that I wrote before you read this passage that we're going to look at today, Luke 9, 10 to 17, that I encourage you to read verses 1 to 9. Something that on the surface, well, on the surface when I was reading it, I thought had nothing to do with the feeding of the 5,000. I was wrong. For one thing, Jesus wasn't with his disciples throughout that passage. He was right at the beginning. Then he sends his disciples out. He wasn't with them. Whereas the passage we're looking at today, Jesus is there. But Jesus gave his disciples something. So this is when Jesus sends his disciples out. This is not what we're looking at, but it will give the background. Jesus gives his disciples something and says, go out. Don't take anything with you. Just go out. What did Jesus give his disciples? He wasn't there. He stayed behind and he sent everybody out. What did he give them? Anybody can remember? Power and authority. He said, I give you the power and authority to cast out demons, to heal the sick. And they went out. And they did these things. These questions, two questions, that I want you to think about as we go through the next 15 minutes or so, and then throughout the week. If Jesus gave his disciples power and authority... What has Jesus given us? And what should our response be? Two simple questions 
for us to think about. Over the next few minutes and throughout the week, my hope is you will come up with some answers for these questions. Like I said, this is not the first time we've looked at this passage since I started, and I'm sure for those of you that have been at church a number of times, you've looked at this passage significant numbers of times. Last time, we examined the similarities of feeding the 5,000 with feeding the people of Israel with manna from heaven, with Elisha feeding 100 men, and you can look those up again. But this morning, we're continuing in our series in Luke, whereas I looked at the passage in John. And the interesting thing about the feeding of the 5,000 is what? See if anybody knows this one. It's in all the Gospels, well done. It is the only miracle that Jesus performed that's in all the Gospels. Significant passage. So let's read. Let's read about who fed the 5,000 and how were the 5,000 plus, because it says 5,000 men, women and children, we don't know how many exactly, how were they fed? So Luke 9, if you have your Bibles, you can uh, look at verse 10. When the apostles returned, they told Jesus everything they had done. That's they'd returned from being sent out, casting out demons, praying for the sick, people being healed, taking nothing with them. That's where they were. Now we're reading this part with the 5,000. So they returned... Then he, Jesus, slipped away with them towards the town of Bethsaida. But the crowds found out where he was going, and they followed him. He welcomed them and taught them about the kingdom of God, and he healed those who were sick. Late in the afternoon, the twelve disciples came to him and said, Send the crowds away to the nearby villages and farms so they can find food and lodging for the night. There is nothing to eat here. In this remote place. But Jesus said to them, You feed them. But we have only five loaves of bread and two fish, they answered. Or are you expecting us to go and buy enough food for this whole crowd? For there were about 5,000 men there. Jesus replied, Tell them to sit down in groups of about 50 each. So the people all sat down. Jesus took the five loaves and two fish, looked up toward heaven, and blessed them. Then breaking the loaves into pieces, pardon me, he kept giving the bread and fish to the disciples so they could distribute it to the people. They all ate as much as they wanted, and afterward, the disciples picked up 12 baskets of leftovers. Now, we've already noted, because I've said it, (laughs) that immediately prior to this event, Jesus sent his 12 disciples to proclaim the kingdom of God, and he told them not to take anything. They were to trust God, to have faith that God would provide. Here we have another challenge around trust. But rather than just trusting God will provide for them, Jesus, in a way, is asking them to trust God will provide for 5,000. And rather than healing or casting out demons, yes, it does say that he did some healing, but at this particular moment, it is for the practical need of food. I believe, hope you don't mind me saying on your behalf, I believe most of us would have been like the disciples. And said to Jesus, Jesus, send them home. You know, or send them out to the farms and and to the areas so that they can get some food. That, to me, is the logical and thoughtful response. You care for these people? You don't have anything for them? Send them away so that they can be okay. That's probably what I would have done. Let me tell you 
a story from the late 19th century that may help in unpacking a few keys from the story I believe that we can look at this morning. The children dressed, sorry, the children are dressed and ready for school, but there is no food for them to eat. The house mother of the orphanage informed George. George is a German missionary to England. And over his time, he was born in 1805, lived till 1898. Over his time, I don't know exactly when he set up the orphanage, there were over a thousand children went through his orphanage. But at this particular time, 300 children were there. George asked the house mother to take the 300 children into the dining room and have them sit at the tables. It's hard enough getting your family to sit at the table. Now you're getting 300 kids to sit at a table and you have no food for them. The children sat down. George thanked God for the food and waited. George knew God would provide food for the children, as he always did. Within minutes... A baker knocked on the door. Mr. Muller, he said, last night I could not sleep. Somehow I knew that you would need bread this morning. I got up and baked three batches for you. I will bring it in. Soon, there was another knock at the door. It was the milkman. His cart had broken down in front of the orphanage. The milk, the, mil, milk, the milk would spoil by the time the wheel was fixed. He asked George if he could use some free milk. George smiled as the milkman brought in 10 large cans of milk. It was just enough for 300 thirsty children. George was informed that there was no food for 300 orphans. The disciples were aware that 5,000, 5,000 plus people would be hungry. Both George and the disciples did the same thing, but in a very different way. They went to God. They went to Jesus. Now, you have probably been told this hundreds, thousands of times, that if you seek Jesus, he will provide your needs. If you need something, you should be seeking God. The only thing different here is that even if it does include them, they are seeking God that's George and the disciples, they are seeking God for the needs of others. For the children and for the men and women, the 5,000 plus who are tired and hungry. We need to follow that example. We need to seek God first, to seek Christ, to seek his compassion to seek his love for others. Now you might be thinking I'm stretching it a little bit because they disciples came to Jesus and said, send them away, you do it. You notice they didn't do it, they went to Jesus and said, look, we need to do something, can you send them away? And like I said a few weeks ago, Tony Campolo, gave that, I gave that example of a group of ladies and... He told them they should provide the money for the need that they were presented with. But here, feeding 5,000 people, the disciples went to Jesus. They didn't have money. They didn't have food. They couldn't provide stuff for the people that were in need at that time. And Jesus' response 
just does my head in. You feed them. I'm not 100% sure. In fact, I'm not even 50% sure what Jesus really meant by those words. Was he saying this to emphasize the inability of the disciples to provide? Or was he saying it so that he could show God's ability? To show that Jesus is able? Maybe both. I also believe it shows Christ's care for our physical needs. Yes, the story is often referred to as an example of this what's called messianic banquet, a meal, a banquet where people will be with the Savior, an eschatological banquet, that's a fancy word for saying, an end times feast that you can look up and see first mentioned in Isaiah 25. But can it also be people are simply hungry in need of some food, and Jesus provides it for them. Apart from the miracle of making the fish and bread appear for 5,000, what do you notice about the meal? Do you notice that there are 12 baskets of leftovers? Perhaps that's an example of God's generosity, God's abundance. But what I noticed was that the meal God multiplies is a meal given to him that we read in John and other areas, and it's not a fancy five-course meal. Two fish and five barley loaves is what it says in John. And barley loaves were just ordinary dark bread of that the Galilean peasant would eat. An incredibly simple meal. I personally don't think there's anything profound about the meal, except I think it shows that God can use anything. Now, Jesus did not say, hmm, all you've given me is these bread and fish, go get me something better, and then I'll produce something for you. Sometimes I think as Christians, we do that. We say, when we are better, God will be able to do something. When I've done A, B, C, D, then God will do do it. When I have finished this, then I'm sure God will step in. When I've got myself all together, then I will be able to help other people. I don't think I have enough. What I have isn't that fancy. My house is a little bit messy. I haven't cleaned it. So I can't invite people over. What if I offer something to somebody and they're not used to what I offer? Maybe I'll offend them. This isn't my plan for the day. I'm not an expert. I might get tongue-tied. What I have, it's nothing special. I'm just doing my job. This is, you know, nothing important. We have never done something like this before. We, we, we could never do that. And, and what about, I've never seen anything like that done before. I'm sure God wouldn't do that. Praying for food and it appearing. Feeding 5,000 people or more with five loaves and two fish. Yes, God did it. He provided the disciples were involved as well, a little bit. The baker, the milkman, 
was involved with the other story, feeding for the kids. The meal I offer to someone else may be an open door for a conversation. Your listening ear at work may break down someone's preconceived ideas. Providing your neighbor with a lift may lead to a growing friendship, and the list is endless. We are to seek God first, but we are to share. Share the love of God by sharing what you have been giving, given with others. Share your talents, your gifts, your abilities, your resources, your table. What, how, when, where, who, I don't know. But I do know, like the disciples, God is calling us to seek him and share what we have. When we do that, we will see, notice what I've done there? It's a good Baptist thing, three letters all starting the same. We will see God do great things. Others may see God through you and in you. They may see in seeking and sharing a God who truly sees them. I want to finish again by looking at a few words from that passage. Don't worry if you can't see them, it's just the ones that are in bold. You, we, us, and disciples. Jesus said, you feed them. It wasn't you singular, it was you plural. He was talking to the disciples. He did not ask one person. He was asking a group. Jesus does give specific tasks. We read it all through scripture of to one person, but often it is to groups of people. When we seek God and we share what we have, we will see. For me, this speaks loudly to our desire to be committed to Christ, seeking him and sharing what we have. When Sam is sharing at um, Botany Young Life, he is doing it, but we are doing it because part of it comes from us. When you are serving in your workplace, yes, it's you, but support, hopefully, support and encouragement by others means that we are with you. In community, we can see what God is doing here in Eastview, in the community of East Auckland and around the world. According to some data I got on the census for 2018 and some other, because I, I think the last census, I couldn't find all the details. Here's a really rough picture for you, for us. Auckland has around about 1.7 million people. And if all of those who claim to be followers of Jesus are true followers of Jesus, Around a million people in Auckland are not. Around half of Auckland, and less so in East Auckland, um, say that their heritage is European. Over 40%, so just under half, of Auckland were not born in New Zealand. Why have I mentioned those statistics? Well, I think, let me, I think there might be multiple responses to those statistics. Let me say them again really quickly, see if any of you came up with the same response I did. 
around 1.7 million live in Auckland. At least a million, at least a million are not Christian. And over 40% were not born in New Zealand. And for someone like me, well, actually, for someone like any of us, about half of, at least half of our city is different to us. These are some responses I thought might cross your mind. Wow. That's a little bit different and a little bit overwhelming to think of these things. This one is the one that crossed my mind. I don't believe that close to 40% of Auckland are Christian. So for me to say, you know, at least a million, I'd say there's a lot more than a million who don't know Jesus. And the one response that I wish, I wish had crossed my mind first, but it didn't, was, wow, what an opportunity we have to see God move. I need to seek God first, share what I I have with those around me, and see God work on these at least million people. That didn't cross my mind. It should have, but it didn't. So let me finish with a challenge. This challenge is not huge. I'm not asking us to feed 5,000 people every week for the next four years so that we can cover the million people. How about we seek God for one person or one family who we could share something with and see what God does with that? One family, one thing in one week. Come back next week and tell others what happened. May just be a conversation. May just be, I gave, I mowed my neighbor's lawns and they said thank you. But now we have a conversation. I don't know what it is. We are part of a community and we need to strengthen our community. We at Eastview, particularly those who are who are newish to Eastview, or even if this is your first time, we're part of the wider Baptist churches. And one of the things the Baptist churches have is they have a vision for Baptist churches in New Zealand. I looked it up, and and it said the following, that they want to focus on four things. To be walking together as a committed community. To be seeking together as a listening community to be worshipping together as a Christ-centered community and uniting together as an interdependent community. Don't worry about that as much, but it's pretty clear they're talking about being part of a community. Jesus fed 5,000 people with a little bit of bread and a couple of fish. He may or may not ask us to do something that amazing. It would be pretty cool to see. But clearly, 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 God calls us to be in community. What has Jesus given us? What should our response be? I think our response is to seek God to share what we have, and to see what he will do when we do that. Let me pray, and then we're going to sing a couple of songs to finish. Father, I thank you that you call us to go into your world and share what we have. But you are with us, just like the disciples 
who didn't know what to do and you provided a miracle and they handed out the food, you were with them. Just like George, when he's praying, you are present, were present there and had already arranged things so that those children got food. And just wherever we are, in our small groups, in our families, in our home groups, in our workplaces, schools, wherever you are there. And when we seek you, and when we share what we have, we will see things happen. Just like Kit gave that amazing story this morning, and we thank you for the answer to prayer. Seeking for her mum, sharing, people sharing as well to help them. And they see some wonderful things. Help us do that. Amen.